25 minutes before last shooting light big doe came out they're out there feeding that big doe she snapped her head up and looked to the gas line or the power line right away and turned her whole body and just like full attention at that and i'm like ooh. <laughs> and i look out the side and here he comes just you just saw this rack walking he just slowly walked right across that power line and he kind of started posturing for the doe i think he was kind of stiff-legged walking and uh he gave me a shot 27. my unfortunately my lighted knock didn't go off i wasn't sure how i hit him but he whirled and just took off like a bat. So I get out, I can't find any blood anywhere. I'm not seeing any sign that I was expecting to see. I find my arrow, it looked like really good bright blood. The lack of blood where he ran across some turnips, like I was just like, man, I don't know. So I stuck the arrow in the ground and start texting my buddies. I'm like, you know, I'm not, I don't know. And I said, I, I'm just gonna leave him till tomorrow morning, come in daylight and find him. I don't wanna push him. So my buddy Tim calls me away, dude, it's supposed to rain from like 2 a.m. to noon tomorrow. I'm like, oh, gosh, it's the worst thing you can hear, you know? Lights, camera, follow the trail. Red and shoot. If you know where a deer's bedding and you know where he's eating, that deer should be dead. Camera. If you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching them. I've got 30 bucks in the Michigan record book. Everyone but one has had at least one previous wound on his body. Some had as many as four. <laughs> The Exodus Podcast, your source for all things whitetail. All right, episode episode one, day one, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. A ton of podcasts, and we had an impromptu guest here, Damien, Whitetail Cribs guest, past podcast guest. Guest, you want to introduce yourself and tell people who who you are if they didn't catch either the Whitetail Cribs or uh, the last episode about the moon. Damien Riffle from uh, East Central. Ohio, and I did uh, obviously the Whitetail Cribs with you guys. Uh, what was that like two years ago now, right? Or pushing it. Yeah. And then uh, we did a podcast shortly after that about the new moon. Um, the vast majority of the deer I've killed had come in the October new moon, but seemed to be continuing into uh, the November new moon as well now. <laughs> What's it like being a moon guy? <laughs> In the streets. <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> I, I never really like intentionally tried paying attention to it and it just the first time it happened i i just made notice and then the following year it happened and the following year it happened and the following year it happened and like it just started i, I started paying attention to the window it's not necessarily the exact new moon but i've killed i don't know a bunch of deer between three days prior to the new moon and two days after the new moon in October, which that also incorporates September 30th. One of them was uh, September 30th, which w happened to be the new moon that year. This year uh, was the end of November, and or I'm right, yeah, end of November, and it was a new moon again. So it just, um, the new moon seems to like me, which, you know, you hear plenty of stuff, the juries included, you know, they hate the new moon. They're all about the full moon. And I don't think there's, you know, you guys have said it, like you don't feel that there's an exact science to it, whatever it is. And it, it seems to be following me, you know, it, and it's not property specific because two years ago, shortly after the whitetail cribs, the, the lease that I had for 12 years that most of those deer were killed on sold like abruptly and i moved to a new farm uh, probably almost an hour mm -hmm. uh, you know 45 minutes 50 minutes from the from that farm the difference there is it doesn't seem to hold the deer early season like the old farm did not yet anyway um i keep grooming it every year and hopefully it'll start holding deer but those deer seem to be moving in late october so could come into play. Um, last year, the the buck I killed it uh, last year is a mainframe, 160 inch eight point. Um, the only time he daylighted was uh, November, or I'm sorry, October 16th. And I think I actually sent you the photo mm -hmm. when he did it because yep. he, he uh, daylighted. The only time he daylighted was before I killed him in November was October 16th, which was the new moon. I don't know. I can't explain it. I'm. <laughs> Where are those? The majority of those daylight photos or occurrences and encounters happening? Like, are they in on food? Are they around bedding? Mostly food. 
Um, I obviously Ohio, it's legal to bait. I use bait for inventory purposes mostly. Obviously, if a if a deer is being stupid and yeah. daylighting, you're going to make yeah. an attempt on him. You'd be dumb not to. But it's not always necessarily bait. It's a food plot, right. um, and it's not. Um, necessarily in cover, food in cover, or an open field. It's just getting them moving, just seeing them on trails, activity in daylight. You might not get him. You know, if you're running a feeder or something, he might not show up there until after dark, but he's on his feet coming to it, staging up prior to dark. So it's kind of across the board. It might be a food plot, might be a feeder, might be transition areas. It, It all seems to kind of vary. So when you say you're grooming a farm, I think a lot of people think of a, a variety of habitat improvements. Maybe it's late season food or something like that. Are you trying to make improvements for that late October new moon time frame? If that's where most of your success has been, I'm a big food plot guy. Um, my old lease, I'd plant about 12 acres of food plots all together. Um, they ranged anywhere from an acre to five acres was the biggest field. My intentions with this farm, it's there's no ag in the area. The closest ag, and I think that's part of the reason why I don't have deer, is about three quarters of a mile to my west is, or probably a mile, honestly, um, is beans and corn. And I feel that's where the deer are during the summer, late summer, early early October. Once the crops get harvested, they start moving out. This property has uh, about 13 acres of field on it, but it's mm-hmm. just used for hay. When I bought it, it was pretty much just grown up fields that the that it would get cut once a year for hay you know just to maintain it since i got permission last year the one backfield i planted it all in turnips it was incredibly active late season and the the buck that i killed this year pretty much spent all of late season there found his sheds not far from there um so my intentions with this farm and i'm going to talk to the farmer that cuts the hay off it is i want to i want to get some grain crop in there. I want to get, honestly, the front field I'd love to have in corn because the bad piece of this property is the moment you pull off the road, any deer in those fields instantly know you're pulling into the farm because there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it, sure. <laughs> you know, and then it's the same thing, leaving, going in and out. Um, so corn on that front half would conceal me a lot better to be able to get in and out of that. The backfield, I put it in clover this year to, to kind of see how it would do. We had a little bit of a, a dry spring and it, it kind of took a while for that clover to really take hold but it by october it was it lush and really thick did you buy this farm or lease this farm um lease lease okay yeah it was uh it's a a friend of a friend Mm -hmm. and uh he's just kind of lost interest in hunting he's older his kids are grown and uh when i lost my lease you know he he offered it to me and you know i was pretty fortunate to kind of step into it so it's not a big piece it's only 60 acres um, but it's a good 60 acres. The 180 acres behind it is owned by two doctors out of Cleveland. They only gun hunt, so there's no pressure back there bow season. To my knowledge, nobody to the north bow hunts that I've seen any indication of. In the south, it appears just from what I hear ATV-wise is somebody bow hunts like the first two weeks of November kind of sure. thing, but um, very little hunting pressure on it it's and surrounding it i believe kind of backs up like the buck i killed this year that we're looking at on the floor here oh. he stayed on pattern every single day of uh shotgun season except for one and the, the, that was thursday of shotgun so you season. held him basically through the he wasn't of he wasn't uh staying on that property he was he came from the north and and left to the north every time and to, i don't know if you want to go into this buck or not yeah um So last year, I got permission to to hunt this property in August. I ended up shooting a 160-inch 8-point mainframe 8 with some stickers and trash on November 2nd. I continued to kind of – I wanted to learn the property, see what kind of genetics are in the area. So I I fed heavily through the entire season, and I want to go back to that part in in a little bit. But So this buck showed up um, the week after gun season. So I had no photos of him all of November. Actually, Sunday night of gun season, this deer showed up on the property on the the, the turnip patch that I had, had put in there, and I was also had a feed site on it. And he was there every day from that point on, the entire season all the way to March, till he shed his antlers. On the far west side of the property, 
the deer had kind of a, there's a kind of a brushy area kind of grown up field and that deer would daylight up there a lot. Um, so this year I early spring, actually it was right about shed season. I took my tractor up there and I cleaned it out and I put in a, an acre food plot hoping to kill this deer. Cause last year I found the sheds 157 inches, um, had good, great potential. So he was kind of my one, number one contender going into this year. And that, if he stuck around, so I put that food plot in, planted it in clover early year or early in the spring, just to put vet green in there. I didn't want to take it over with weeds. And then in August, I went in put turnips, uh, built a, a, a permanent ground blind in there and kind of set it up as my kill spot for this deer. So the, uh, the season started progressing into velvet season, uh, July 3rd, I got one photo of him walking down a trail, kind of swinging his head, and you could just see mass and and spread, and you could see there was a little bit of a split on his G2, and I was like, that deer's, you know, 60s, mid-60s looking deer, you know, or it could be, and uh, I kind of set my sights on him at that point, never got another photo of him, as you know, and obviously when you're hunting and you're trying to hunt a buck and he's not there. Like it, it, it's an emotional roller coaster. And, uh, my, uh, my, my good friend that, uh, I talk a lot with, he was on a giant 196 inch deer and on another piece of property he was hunting would randomly have like this 180 show up. So I had nothing there that I was wanting to kill. So I'd randomly just kind of, you know, try to catch catch some luck to shoot a 180 that would randomly show up sure. on this property, right? <laughs> Didn't work. problem to have. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. I'm like, gee, you, you know, you hand, hand off a 180. I don't want to shoot him. But, I mean, <laughs> the, the 195 that he ended up killing um, – that he was after was on a pattern he didn't want to give up. And, I mean, who would, right? So that didn't work out. Came into November. I was hoping from my, my intel from the year before – all the new bucks um, that weren't local showed up between November 11th and November 18th. And that, went, that was like the hot spot on that farm. Um, and see, he still hadn't shown. So fingers crossed he was going to show up in that window is, is kind of where I was hoping. Um, so where he was coming into that turnip plot and the, the trail that I got him coming in on in July – is right on the property line. The field is the property. Just a few feet into the woods is um, the neighboring property. And uh, so there's all kinds of trails coming out of there, and there's there's no trees. So you, it's not like you can cover a lot of trails with cameras. You're putting stakes in the ground and, you know, setting cameras. So what I did is uh, on uh, November 12th, I went in and just dumped a bag of corn right on, inside the weeds, hoping to inventory anything cruising through there looking for does. And they'd swing over and, and step in front of the camera. Um, two days later, uh, it was uh, a Saturday. I was hunting in the morning, and it hit noon. I got down. I walked to my truck. I, I'm going into town to get lunch, and I'm like, I wonder if anything moved today. I opened up my app. And while I was at my trucks changing, this buck was 200 yards away, <laughs> standing in front of that camera oh, wow. on the corn I dumped. Being MIA day, forever. Right, <laughs> after being MIA. And it was broad daylight and just like, you and know. then you saw how big he was then too. Right. Well, you're right. So, <laughs> so I opened that app. And you know, when you see a big buck and you get them little tiny like yeah. thumbnails and all you see is <laughs> rack, like. You know, I, I, I about shit my pants. I was like, oh, you know, I couldn't hit the button quick enough. So I opened it up and like, like I think I had, he stood there with a doe for like 12 minutes. So I had like 12 photos of him. And he, he gave me every look, but looking straight at the camera. He was looking away. He was looking at profiling. Just a big one, you know, just beautiful deer. And I was like pumped. I couldn't get back to the farm quick enough, you know. The bad thing was I figured where he's, that whole uh, neighboring property is thick, like super thick CRP, uh, kind of reminds me of Kansas, like cedars and just rolling kind of, you know, it's just perfect deer habitat, multiflora rose thing. So I'm like, okay, he's in there somewhere. Um, now I'm hoping tonight he comes back and comes out into the field was my only hope. Bad thing is I didn't have any stands to set for that spot, right? There, there's nothing close that you can hunt. And then we had a West wind and, uh, so I go into the old cabin, 
and uh, I'm like just digging for like a climbing stand. You know, there's there's like an old barn there with some old hunting stuff, and I'm I'm just trying to think of something. And I look under the one bed, and I see something, and I pull it out, and I and it's a ghost blind, and I'm like, that's my option, right? That's so the blind that has the, the mirror, the like, mirror, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's reflective, and I, I, that you know, I'm like, okay, there's all CRP grass, there's a bunch of pines. I'm like, this might work. Yeah. So. I, I, I go over there and I find a spot under this pine tree and I, I like set the, the blind up under these limbs and I kind of trim it out and I go out in the field and look and I, no kidding, dude, like as gimmicky or as you want to say, like they, I look back at that thing they were. and it was gone. Like there was n- you, there's a human could walk by that thing and look at it and from 15 yards and not know it was there. And I was like, this is, this might work. And I figured the shot would be long from, from where the, the South edge of the field to where I had dumped that bag of corn was about 105 yards, but I was hoping he would come out into that clover and give me an opportunity. So I, I, I cut the limbs out to where I could stand up to get a shot because I figured it'd be a longer shot, and uh, it started getting... You so know, when you say longer, like 40 yards, 50 yards? Well... 60? Yeah, somewhere in that range. <laughs> um, so I wanted to be able to stand up, get good form, you know, take, take a, and take a good shot at him. So I'm sitting there, and, and obviously my, my wireless camera was sitting there, and I just keep refreshing the app, right? And there's deer there, and I just keep refreshing it, refreshing it, <laughs> refreshing it. And then right at, like, prime time, now this is the crazy part, is the pine trees that I'm in are solid row of pines, and you can't see through them from the field to the other side and vice versa. Well, from where I'm sitting, I can see the neighbor's house. It's 110 yards from me, and he comes outside, and he walks over to his barn, and he has a little mini farm, and he starts banging on feed buckets and yelling at the dog, and he's got donkeys and emus and all this shit, and all these animals, and the ducks are quacking, and all this noise is going on, and I'm like, Ugh, and I'm just like disgusted. I'm like, I might as well just leave. And I look up in the field, and that buck and another buck are stepping out in the field, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me! Oh, like he's literally. <laughs> 150 yards from this guy and he walks out into a wide open field and I'm I'm just kind of dumbfounded about it and I'm just awestruck because this deer's the mass that he has even he stepped out at 75 yards and I just like his beams I was like holy Christ you know he's way bigger than I thought well not way bigger but he's bigger than I thought and uh so he starts feeding He's not paying any attention to this guy outside, and he keeps feeding slightly towards me, and he turns perfectly broadside, and I range him at 63, and uh, I shoot the garment sight, and uh, I'm like, there's my shot. Feeding, relax, both of them are relaxed, the guy's back there. So I draw back, and I come to anchor, and I always cognitively think about where I'm going to set my pen, and typically at 63 yards, I'm going to aim at the the very bottom of his chest, right? And I'm like, he's not going to react with all this background noise. I shoot, and he ducked my arrow. And, like, just barely. Thank- I was so thankful that I didn't touch him. He had no idea what happened, and he ran, like, 15 yards, stood there, looked around, and just went back to feeding. And he <laughs> fed till after dark, and I, I just slipped out, right? So I'm like, I can't believe that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of gutted, you know, and I'm like, woe is me to my buddies. We yeah. have a group text that, you know, all the, the hardcore guys. So, um, the next day I go in and I cut out the pine tree and put sticks up the backside of it. And I get a stand in there and had the saw and, and got a, a just a, like an Eagle's nest in there. <laughs> and, uh, now from that elevated platform, I could see into the thick stuff where the corn's at, and um, he came to the corn, but he never came out in the field that night. So he was 105 yards from me, something like that. Um, Then he was gone for five days, and I just kept checking cameras, hoping, you know. Then he came back, and he was in the field uh, two nights in a row, and then... From the cell camera? From cell camera, not he didn't hit the corn anymore, um, but he just he somehow he was bypassing it and coming out into the field. And I had another cell camera out in the field, and he triggered it two nights in a row, and then um, he was gone two nights, and then he the next time I got a photo of him, I got a photo of him on the food plot that I put in that I wanted to kill him on. When he found that food plot, 
he became every day. And he said, it was just like that, just like that. The moment he found that food plot and it was, it was beautiful. Like that, the, the, the turnips and brassicas in that plot just turned out phenomenal. The soil is really good. And, uh, once he found it and he, he just became daily, um, he would always show up within the first hour of dark and he'd be gone all night. And then I'd get another photo of him an hour, the last hour of dark before daybreak. And, uh, he would always come from the north across the power line and always leave to the north every time. And uh, when that happened and he had that pattern going, I pulled all my cameras from everywhere I had cameras. And, and like, it was a minefield of cameras. <laughs> and I had him pretty well narrowed down to the two trails that he was coming off the neighboring property um, that I felt that I was going to. And I went in, hung stands, had everything ready. But I, I had to have a west wind or a south wind to hunt those stands. Then Ohio gun season came in. Um, he never changed pattern, kept that pattern every day, but Thursday of gun season figured maybe he got boogered that day. He showed up two hours after dark that day. Um, and then I typically stay out during gun season cause I don't want to push anything off if they're bedded or whatever, you know? So, um, Saturday of gun season, I'm at home building my wife a, a new uh, barn door for her goat barn. And I got all finished up and it was like prime time, you know, just starting to set sun. And I opened up my, my wireless app and the buck is standing in my food plot in shooting light. And I'm just gutted, <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm like, man. And, and even then, even though I was gutted, I was like, I thought to myself, I was like, it's new moon tomorrow. He might duplicate it, right? And uh, then the best thing that I could hap happen happened is he typically, when he came in in the mornings, he would come in at like 5 a.m., leave by 6 a.m. The next morning, he didn't get there till 6 a.m., left right at daylight. The last photo I got of him going across the, the power line, um, it was probably shooting light, right at the border of shooting light. I'm like, okay, he's, he's not far. So... Uh, I'm like, I, I need to get in there and try to kill him tonight. So I went in, in uh, that box blind, I tried to seal it up as scent proof as possible. We had a south wind, so I couldn't hunt my stands where I figured he was coming from. But that that plot kind of runs the ridge, and it's kind of a horseshoe shape, and he's coming this way. The blind's over here, so we're, we would kind of have that cutting wind where it worked in both of our favors. My scent's blowing over the valley. He's walking out the ridge. And, uh, but I didn't want to take chances that, and I knew that setting that blind and building it there, I siliconed it, spray foamed it. Like it was as tight as you could get it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I went in that night, got in and tip the first, the other two times that I hunted that stand all year, I saw like 20, 25 deer each time. And it was pretty much from one o'clock in the afternoon on deer were in and out of that plot that night. Um, didn't see a deer till four o'clock and it was a button buck solo. Um, a half hour later, a uh, doe fawn came out. They kind of met up in the middle and was feeding around. And uh, then about probably 25 minutes before last shooting light, big doe came out. They're out there feeding. And my high hopes were starting to dwindle. And uh, I started kind of lightly gathering my stuff and putting stuff in my pack and stuff like that. And I just kind of kept an eye on those does and that big doe, she snapped her head up and looked to the gas line or the power line right away and turned her whole body and just like full attention at that. And I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> and I look out the side and here he comes. Just, you just saw this rack walking and he, he had a walk where he just kind of swing his head side to side as he'd come in. And I'm like, oh, man, here he comes. And he just slowly walked right across that power line, right in, kind of started posturing. And so I kept the window shut on him until he was, like, perfectly beside me, and there was a big stump there that I had pushed out to make that plot. And when he went behind that, I started sliding the window open, and then he stepped out, and he kind of started posturing for the doe, I think. He was kind of stiff-legged walking up at her, and uh, he gave me a shot, 27 my, unfortunately, my lighted knock didn't go off. I wasn't sure how I hit him, but he whirled and just took off like a bat, you know? And uh, I thought he left the field low. And when I pushed the, the plot out on that side, I pushed everything into like a row. And there's only two places on that side of the field that they could leave. So I get out. I can't find any blood anywhere. And uh, 
can't find my Wait, hair. So when you me. when you say you pushed into row like a, a timber wall or like a brush wall or feather um, it? it was just brush. It was all the yeah. the treetops and small trees that I pushed out and multiflora rows. I just pushed it into just a brush row, and it wasn't intentionally to funnel deer, but it works great to funnel deer. The only two places I left open were the the old farm access road and then the the main trail that deer sure. typically used coming through there. Um, so. I get out. I'm not seeing any sign that I was expecting to see. And uh, I find my arrow. Looked like really good, bright blood. Uh, but the lack of blood where he ran across some turnips, like you had them big, broad leaves, you should see blood. And I wasn't seeing anything. And I was just like, man, I don't know. So I stuck the arrow in the ground and start texting my buddies. I'm like, you know, I'm not, I don't know. And, and, uh, I said, I, I'm just going to leave him till tomorrow morning, come in daylight and find him. I don't want to push him. So my buddy, Tim, he, he owns a landscaping business, calls me right away. Dude, it's supposed to rain from like 2 a.m. to noon tomorrow, uh, 100%. I'm like, oh, God, it's the worst thing you could hear, you know. <laughs> Happens all the time, so, too. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's always the night you shoot something. So I uh, maybe we should look into that. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so put a game plan together, and a couple of my buddies, they were hunting – relatively close and uh the, the one my one buddy he's got a guy that's uh training a dog the blood trail so he's like i'll call my buddy he'll probably come out just for the the training aspect and i was like well we're on limited time so why not right mm -hmm. so i had stuck that arrow in the ground and i went in and while i was waiting for them at 9 30 i shot him at like uh 20 20 after five i think it was and uh my buddies were going to be there at 9 30 so I went in, bought a, a spotlight, and they came out. We we all headed across the field, and the dog's on like a 50-foot lead, and he has a collar with a light under his kind of neck, you know, and he's a bloodhound. And he was like, I think, he'd, I think he was a year old, so he's a pup. And uh, as we're going across the bottom field, the, the power line goes up, and I shined up the power line. You see two eyes at the top of the power line. I'm like, oh, there's a deer. Well, then it turns and trots, and it's a coyote. And I'm like, oh, it's a coyote. Well, then we get up there. My arrow's gone. My blood-soaked arrow that I what? stuck in the ground is gone. Like, it is nowhere to be found. Still haven't found it. <laughs> and uh, so the only thing I can figure that coyote smelled the blood on it and took it. Off with it, it yeah. run off with it, right? So That's cool. it was crazy. <laughs> Weird quirk. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> totally. So w the direction I thought the deer, when he let, ran – um, Looked like he was running downhill, but he went out of my sight once he ran 20 yards and went, took the dog that way, didn't find anything. The dog didn't trigger on anything, went up to the other trail, and my buddy Zach found just a one little speck of blood. And we're like, okay, here's the trail. Took a few more drops. There's a bigger splash, and it had bubbles in it. I'm like, better? Tried to get the dog on it. Dog didn't show any interest in it. He just wanted to go off in the woods, right, mm -hmm. and, and get tangled up in the ro multiflora rows. And we were blood trailing. He kind of had the dog up ahead of us, and he just keeps wanting to go off in the woods. And we're, we're blood trailing probably, I don't know, 30 yards, 40 yards in. And the dog goes down under this multiflora rose, and you just see the light over there. And the, the uh, dog handler said, there's your deer. And the dog, I think, I was bad-mouthing the dog, but I think the dog could smell the deer and didn't care about the like, blood. There it is. He could, we, yeah. yeah, he just wanted to go down to the deer. Because with that light on his collar, he was had his front legs on the deer, and you, you could see his white belly lit up, right? So he only ran 80 yards. It was uh, a great shot. I hit him like he was quartering away. I hit him about two inches behind the last rib, and it came out right in the shoulder. Um, and the obviously, the entrance plugged with intestine. Right shoulder was the, the movement of the shoulder just kind of plugged up. it. So he, he bled internally. Where he tipped over, it looked like 10 gallons of blood was laying there. So... Um, pretty excited when we walked up on him he was much more impressive in person than he was in photos um just to throw some numbers at him yeah he Say uh, that mass measurement <laughs> yeah so he grossed 177 and uh three eighths uh his mass measurements are uh 45 and a half his smallest mass measurement he had was four and seven eighths uh one beam is 27 and a half the other beam was 26 uh, 10 inch twos, 10 inch threes, just, you know, Slammer. 20 inches wide, um, right on the dot and <sighs> just a, 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 stud. Um, I just, I, I still can't like stop staring at him every day. You know, it's just, 
He's just awesome. Yeah, and, and a new moon, a new moon. That's a tongue twister. Yeah, new moon it's buck. Uh, it it uh, was another new moon buck, and it was the end of November. You know, last day of gun season. It may have even been I don't even remember now. Was it what was the last day of gun season? Maybe December second, even. Um, but it was it was the new moon. So it's like whatever it seems to come together for me is always in that new moon cycle, um, in that window, and I think it was exactly. Um, on the new moon this year but in the previous year um, the 160 that I shot you know he he daylighted October 16th and daylighted on the on the new moon um, then I killed him November 2nd so those are the only two times that I knew that he ever daylighted um, so I I don't know what it is about it and I you know you sit and think and everybody has their opinions on everything but uh I, I I feel like if you have a big mature deer and you have him pretty well patterned and he's local to your property, like that new moon is is a time to kill him in in my opinion. Now if if you're one of those people that, you know, you have a big buck showing up at one o'clock in the morning and you only get him at one o'clock in the morning, the moon noon is not gonna right. do you're a not damn in the thing ball for game you. Like, yeah, yeah, you're not in the game at all. Yeah. Um but if you know where he's bedding, you know where he's feeding, vice versa, um you it's time to kill him in in my opinion. I mean I, I don't know how to explain it. I got 20 deer and on the the wall that are 140 to 180 and you know they're almost all of them have been killed in that new moon and not intentionally and, and i had a buddy he's like well i think you're killing them in that new moon because you're targeting that moon that's one of the well, things i was gonna break out so, from a comment so and i i thought about that i'm like well i'm not hunting any different like i'm not taking any more chances i'm i'm a pretty conservative hunter i'm not just going out there willy-nilly but and I, it's not like i'm not hunting and i'm not saving stands for particular winds or or any well winds yes but not you know not the new moon and stuff i'm hunting stands that i feel i have the opportunity to kill that deer and those opportunities to kill those deer are always falling on that new moon so on the 18th when you missed them what was the moon status then? That was the fourteenth. Um, fourteenth. That would have been. The, you know, that's a good question. Well, that was pretty much peak rut. Um, so moon, I don't know if you could take it into advance. Plus, he was there at, at noon with a doe. Um, it's, but it's probably close to a full. Moon. It would be close to a yeah. full because you're talking two weeks, right? Kind of cycle. Um, so it would have been close to a, a full. Mm-hmm. Yeah, doe was dragging him wherever. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So if you had to put a percentage of bucks that fall in that new moon um, category, 80%, 90%, 70? Boy, I mean, we went over it in Whitetail Cribs, and, I mean, there's just a couple, like... Outliers. You're right. The the two I've killed in, like, January, obviously, those weren't new moons. Um, but almost every single other deer. I've only killed a couple deer in November in my entire life. Almost, I'm, you know, fortunate enough, I guess, to that most of my deer have been killed in October on that property that I used to have. But it would hold deer At early that time, season. Yeah. So, what about uh, you know transit times in, in correlation with the new moon? Like, have you ever like looked at the transit times? The the like rise and the overhead surf. and yes, underfoot. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I try to to. I haven't really necessarily because with the new moon, it's not typically ever going to be overhead. Obviously, um, so it you're almost looking at the under underfoot mm-hmm. times, um, and I've never. I can't say that it's ever like made lined a up. Or, it's yeah. never lined up like what okay. day that they That's show what I was up. Curious about yeah. Yeah, I've never. I've I've paid attention to it, and I can't say that it's ever lined up to where it was like directly underfoot or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just in that five day or six day window. Sometime in that six day window, sometimes multiple days in that six day window, they'll they'll be on their feet in daylight. I you know I I can't really. I'm not a scientist, yeah. but and to kind of add a level of defense for you, 
people probably have the uh, thought, oh, it's a new moon, you go out and you kill the deer after. Well, if you listen to you, <laughs> 12 acres of food plot, stands, blinds for certain winds of what you think the deer is going to be doing later on, uh, being mobile, making those different plays throughout. I, that's just something that I think Camera probably information discount. information yeah. from the previous year. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. But then people just go, well, it was just the new moon. He, did, he got no, lucky. It, there's, <laughs> there, there's, there's definitely a lot of, of every single deer that I've ever killed, almost – I've got multiple years of kind of patterning them, you know, to, for a, for a deer. I don't want to say you, you at, at two years old, I can't say that a deer is going to be a target by three. You can kind of have an assumption that that deer is going to be something you're going to be wanting to shoot the next year, or the next year after that. Um, so most of the deer that I've killed, I started, keeping the intel from about three on i'll keep you know if they're a superstar at one or two which is pretty rare um i may keep those photos just for my library mm -hmm. if they're you know if they make it through the season and i know it i may keep them to the next year to see if he's there and then you know if he doesn't show up a lot of times i'll wipe those photos whatever the case may be um but almost all of my deer that i've killed i've got multiple de years of of pattern and and they do the same thing most of the time year after year the same time frames um you know the other um one with the big one that i killed that was you know just under 180 you know same thing with him when he was four and a half he was a giant had a non-typical double main beam i was hoping he'd turn into a 200 but the next year he just grew a bigger frame and became a straight typical that deer he summered on like 10 acres and lived in this thick nasty bedding area that i created hinge cut a bunch of stuff and then he would go out of there into the neighboring bean field right back in there and that's that was his summer cycle and then in september he shed velvet just a couple of days later he disappeared I located him like three quarters of a mile away and season was in by that time when I, when I found him and right when I felt like I was getting his pattern down and figuring him out and thinking I was going to get a chance, he showed up and his entire right side, three inches off his head was busted off. Um, so he got the pass that year, knew he was a mega giant. That deer became like, the most visible deer I've ever had on that farm. Like after he broke off, that. after he broke off, like I would drive in the farm three times. There's a giant overgrown strip mine bowl. And I would drive up the hill, park my truck, change my clothes while I'm changing my clothes to go hunt. That buck was on the opposite side of the bowl. And I watched him three different days, breed does while I'm changing my clothes. <laughs> it's being like, an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Just being stupid. And, uh, so I, I had a phenomenal pattern on that deer. The next year he started the same thing in the middle of summer. He was feeding in that same or bedding in that same area that year. I wanted to pull him more onto my property. So, and I didn't want him going down in that neighbor's bean field. So I planted beans on top of the hill. It was just a small little, like two and a half acres of beans. I don't even think it was two and a half. It was probably like an acre and a half. I never really, uh, figured it out. And I would get that buck at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. He'd it's just close, get up out of yeah. his bed, step out into that bean field, and browse around and, and, and eat those beans. And that year, he was still in velvet, but we got a big thunderstorm. Um, it was like mid-September. And huge windstorm, 60-mile-an-hour winds, and the buck disappeared. So I'm like, and he didn't come back. And it was two, three days. And it didn't come back. And I was like, I wonder if he shifted. And I, where he shifted to the year before was where the acorns, he shifted over the oaks when the oaks started dropping. I'm like, big windstorm, brought down early acorns, moved my cameras over there. The very night I moved him there, I had bu that buck back on the same pattern he was on the year before. But this time, I'm three weeks ahead of trying to figure him out. And uh, I, I felt I was going to, to kill him. And then... It was uh, the new moon that year. <clears throat> he was pretty nocturnal, and it was getting into the new moon cycle. I went in, and uh, I saw him out in the neighboring field coming across. his a big saddle. He's bedding on the neighbors, coming across his saddle up into the oaks on, on the property that I leased. And 
Then the new moon was 95 degrees, and that was uh, 2018. Um, and I'm like, there's no way I'm going to hunt tonight. It's 95 degrees. The, the buck daylighted <laughs> on, a, on a feeder of all things that year um, or that night. And then the very next night, it was 95 degrees again. And I'm like, what are the odds he's going to show up two days? Well, he did. So I'm like, okay, shoot me in the butt twice, right? <laughs> so now we're in the, the waning part of that uh, window that I, I look at. And we got um, – it rained most of the day, just a light rain. And it was supposed to stop at like 4.30, so I didn't. I couldn't get in there. I had to work. By the time I got out of work, got a quick shower, got up there. I was walking into my stand, and it, it had stopped raining like 20 minutes prior. And I'm bumping does, and I, it's aggravating me. You know, I'm like, oh, I'm screwing everything up. You know, I'm just kind of sick. And I I get to my stand, and you know, um, I'm sitting there and. I'm looking over this valley, looking at the neighboring property. So, and I, I just wanted to see where he was coming out at and if I could get a lay eyes on him. And uh, what's crazy is I told my buddy that day, I said, I want to hunt that stand right on the property line, but I'm worried if he comes circling downwind that he's going to get downwind of that stand. And uh, I said, but if he does and he comes out where I think he's coming out, there's probably 200 feet of elevation change there from the ridge top I'm on all the way down to the strip mine where the bottom is. And I said, if he does that, I can climb down, use the topography. It rained all day, so it's quiet. And I can move 80 yards to the other side of the draw where he can't get downwind of me. Because if he comes up that draw, I know how they circle around that. So I'm sitting in that stand, and he steps out at 350 yards and like hitting scrape lines, walking up the bottom, cleaning scrapes out, and hits one scrape, hits the next scrape, and then he stops and he looks up the hill to the the uh, little field that I seen him in the previous time, and from there he could either go up the hill or he can come up that draw, and he turned and committed to coming up the draw, and when he did that, I'm like, okay, am I doing this? Am I going to get down and move my stand? Am I this stupid? Like what? A-? So I'm like. He's if he comes up that draw, he's going to get come up. They circle right around and come right down into that stand. I'm like, I got to. If I want to kill this deer, I got to move. So I grab my bow and I drop down, and he's 250 yards at this point, just slowly <laughs> meandering, coming up that draw. And uh, I get like two steps from the ground, and I look, and he's still down there, just slowly sauntering up the thing. I take two steps. I'm out of sight of him. I sprint 80 yards over to my other stand on the other side of that uh, draw, and I sit there. And now I'm, like, hearing things, right? It's just full vegetation at this point. It's October uh, 17th. And I'm sitting there, and uh, I'm, I'm, like, hearing something. I was like, is that a deer stepping? And like, sounded like they were, like, in the leaves just behind this uh, uh, hickory tree. And I'm – so between – me and the other stand is an old um, mining access road that they reclaimed. So it's it's basically just kind of rough, like 25 yard wide where they hold coal okay. out of there. And I'm sitting there, all my attention's right here, and, and I just look down the lane, and boom, he's standing there broadside, 35 yards oh, on the geez. downwind side of my previous stand. Like, would have nailed me had I not moved, yeah. right? And I range him, he's 57 yards, and he's just staring there, just kind of, and I left my pack and stuff in that stand. And I don't know if he smelled it, but he was like face into the wind, and he wasn't moving. It was like he was... Knew something was off Knew something bit. was off or caught wind of something. I don't know, but he, he was, thank God he was standing there for a long time because I ranged him. At that time, I was uh, shooting at a, a single pen HHA, and I set it to 57, and I stood up, and as I stood up, I draw and kind of t- turn my body to, to face him, and uh, I just, I remember focusing so much on just setting that pen, and the Where'd shot you set it broke. on this one? I held him just a little low. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, the shot broke, and he never moved a muscle, and I just remember, uh, to this day, in slow motion, I can see that lighted knock just flying and arching, and it hit him, and he mule kicked, ran to the other side of the the uh, 
the opening and stop just inside the woods. And like, I started exciting, right? Like, I'm like, he's dead. And within just a couple seconds, he just tipped over right there. <laughs> and like, it, it was to that day, like that, that deer is still, um, a half inch bigger than this buck gross. And that I killed him this year. And I, I don't think I will ever have a more, like memorable that's pretty like cool. hunt like the 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 everything about that deer like and and i looking back um i found video footage of my wife and i hunting and that buck came out in one of my food plots when he was a three-year-old and uh you hear me say that deer is going to be a damn giant if he <laughs> survives and uh and then lo and behold that's you know, cool. he was <laughs> so um you know and i it, just so many not as um, in detail stories of bucks, but all the bucks I've killed has some sort of history where I got multiple years of experience of a deer doing something and, and all that coming together and giving me the opportunity to kill him in the new moon. So mm -hmm. whether there's something behind it or I'm just damn lucky, I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, what's the saying? Lightning doesn't strike twice in, in the yeah. same location. It seems to yeah. hit the same location Over, pretty often. Right, with you. right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, you kind of have allu alluded to this, but in your opinion, if you had to boil it down, when do you feel is the best time of year to kill a mature buck? If you had to just boil it down in the most basic way. And then I still will say if you're on a, patterned big deer that last week of october and if you can get that and it's so be it the year that this all comes together if you can get that new moon in that last 10 days of october like i i don't think i would have any better confidence in going in to kill a deer than than that time sure because you know when the, when the once november hits and that halloween like you can have these deer on pattern and getting photos of them that deer might be three miles it's away that day. That, yeah. You know, you don't know. You could be sitting in that stand, but in October, you know when you, or at least when I go in, that buck is probably within 500 yards of me. You know, and and going in, knowing that, like the the it's another expectation, layer of, of confidence, that, right? Yeah, you're it, there it to just kill gives something. it to you. And the same thing late season. You know, you get that big heavy snowfall, you give them food, or you have a food plot that they're hitting. I mean, it. I don't want to say it makes it easy um, late season, um, but there's there's a lot of different levels to contend with in late season. You know, you can throw out a bag of corn, whatever the case may be, um, and a foot and a half of snow, those deer need to eat. But at the same time, those deer have been hunted all year round. You're going to have high numbers of deer. Super open. Super open. You know, they're, they're on edge. You know, they know that... You know, every corn pile, there's some fat hunter sitting in a tree, you know, 20 yards them, away yeah. wanting to shoot them, you know. So yeah. the, you have to, and typically the deer that you're going to want to kill is the last one coming in. So you have to get by all those other deer coming in first mm -hmm. in order to get the opportunity at your deer. So I'm, I don't want to say late season sitting over a corn pile is easy, but it... um if if you figure out the formula and 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 use it to your advantage, it definitely can be a, a very highly successful time. And then we were—I was talking earlier, um, and I said I wanted to come back to this. Um, so on this sixty acres, when I got it, um, so many times, you know, in Ohio, everybody just assumes. You just take a bag of corn, you dump a bag of corn, you're going to inventory every deer on that property. And I think that is the probably worst mistake that, that people um, assume. I think it is a phenomenal inventory tool and locating where deer are. Um, but deer have um, areas that they prefer. Um, I got on that same farm. So on 60 acres, for instance, when I got permission to hunt it, I, I run about 10 cell cameras and I had 10 feed spots on that property, just trying 60 acres, 10. Mm -hmm. And I just want to know where the deer are, where they're staying. And, 
you can you can narrow down and in the inventory process that this happens you you find a buck you want and you you have 10 spots he's you're feeding at that buck might only show up at three Mm -hmm. then you cut out all the other ones that leave those three okay out of those three which ones is he frequenting more which one is he hitting closest to daylight so then you can start narrowing down where he's coming from how he's using the terrain um and you can't just assume that every deer on that property is going to go wherever you put food at. Yeah. Um, that's that's the, the number one mistake. And if you're going to bait and, and use feed, I think you need to put it where deer want to be. And you need to put it where deer want to be, but at the same time, your ingress, egress is, is to your advantage. Um, you can't just say, okay, this, this is, I, I like this tree. I'm going to, I'm going to put a feeder here and this is where I'm going to kill something. You have to be where that deer wants to be. Um, case in point, my buddy that was hunting at 195, um, that deer, he was getting that deer pretty much every single day in the heart of his property, but he couldn't hunt that deer with the early season, no matter what the wind was, it would blow up the valley straight in his face, no problems. Once the leaves came off, thermals started getting an effect, started getting sub-zero, super cold temperatures. The wind was sporadic. He'd get back blasts. He couldn't hunt it, right? And it, But this deer was coming in all the time, right? So he's like, I need to move. And then he bumped a couple deer going in that were bedded on the other side of the beaver dam. So he moved that feed spot that he was trying to kill that deer at um, 65 yards. That deer showed up on that feed spot one time, never again. And it was the night he moved it. He put it there. The deer came in that evening in daylight, never came back to that spot for three weeks. He cut the distance in half back to where he was feeding. That deer started coming in every single day, almost instantly. That's interesting. So the only thing we could figure was where he moved it, there was a a high wall and a beaver dam and it narrowed down too much and that deer didn't like being restricted in there and simply moving it 30 yards back to where he was it opened up a little more and that deer instantly came right back and left the best the, the, the crazy part is when he stopped coming in he started going to the neighbors every single day because he's friends with the neighbors the neighbors was sending him photos the moment he moved that back that deer came back and stopped wow. going to the neighbors. Finicky. Yeah. So you can't just assume that if you dump corn or it's that easy. Like you have, every deer has a personality. Every situation you have to take as a learning like step or take it as an opportunity to, to figure these deer out because it's not that simple. Mm-hmm. And, you know, on that, on this, the property I killed on, um, there's a six and a half year old eight point probably doesn't go 130 inches. I wanted him dead. Um, never. I think the entire year up on my food plot, I had him twice. I mean, this is 60 acres. Um, down on the bottom field, I would get him periodically. The south end of the property, 225 yards away, behind the pond. Anytime I would go over there and dump a bag of corn, he would show up instantly, and he was there almost every single day. And, like, that's the only – I mean, you're feeding everywhere. I'm feeding all over this farm trying to hold deer and inventory deer to learn this property, and that deer would only show up one particular spot. And he knew the other spots were there because he had hit them a couple times, so he knew they were there, but he would not leave his safety or his comfort zone – no matter what his desire was. So, you know, I, I think that's that's a big thing that, that people um, – obviously, you guys got a big following in Ohio, and Ohio's a bait state, and it's like the forbidden topic, and nobody ever wants to talk about it because they want to put on this persona like, oh, I'm a better hunter, and, uh, you know, I don't – you know, I'm an open book. Um, I use it to my advantage when I can. Um, I don't think you're going to kill big, mature deer sitting 20 yards over a corn pile – every year um you might get lucky from time to time um but as an inventory tool there's i don't think there's a better inventory tool so that um 
shotgun approach or scatter approach to 10 piles, down to five piles, down the – that's really freaking yeah. interesting because I relate that back to – the approach in some big woods type stuff that we do with trail cameras, like for inventory purposes. So we'll scatter out <coughs> 10 cameras and a certain deer might frequent three of those. So you take the other seven and you kind of right. squeeze that noose in a little bit. So that's, I've never heard anybody talk about it, but soon as soon as you started on it, I'm like, oh, shit, that makes like, and I, I kind of learned at my old lease, um, the big food plot um, that I put in was five acres. And I, that kind of, um, between that, uh, there's two scenarios on that farm that kind of taught me that. In the summertime, I had, I mean, it's five acres, and I'd plant the whole thing in beans, and I would, I, I fed at both ends of the field, right? It's, it's 275 yards long, and I would get bucks at the north end that would never be at the south end all summer. And I'm like, that's weird. You know, and then same thing as, as, as I started hunting that, that spot year after year, the, it was like, there was a, a, a wall built on, through the middle of that property. And those deer would never go to the east side and the deer on the east side would never go to the west side. And they, they wouldn't go back and forth. Even very rarely in the rut, would you see them go over that like invisible wall? And that's when I really started kind of playing the shotgun approach as you called it on that property and that was 135 acres so i i would i would feed like 17 different spots on that farm just trying to inventory what's where where they're at where they want to be and then, and the same thing you just start whittling, whittling down next thing you know you know where you know he's daylighting most where he's bedding probably and you can just you know inventory what you need there so yeah. makes sense and I, I don't think enough people take that approach. They just, you know, they run out there, dump one spot, no throw a camera it, on it, yeah. no, no, yeah. Ca yeah. no, you know. Yeah. And and many times it's not even where the deer want to be. Right. Like they they, it's on a field edge or right. just they just assume that you know. Whereas, um, I remember years ago, uh, buddy wanted me to go look at his property, and uh, you would go down in the woods and the snow was on and he was feeding. Um, on the, it was kind of a big bowl and he was feeding on the West side of it. And like, you look at the topography of everything with the leaves off and there's a saddle, the roads up here, there's a big deep saddle and he's like over here. And then there's a huge high wall and like to get deer to come where he was feeding, like there was no real reason for the deer to want to be there, but it was easier for him. Sure. So that's where he started feeding. And I said, well, you know, and, and I asked him, I said, why are you feeding here? I said, why wouldn't you feed over there? I was like, those deer naturally are going to be going through that, that draw and using that topography, you know, don't try to pull them out of their path of travel. You want to be in their path of travel. And, and, and he, he was like, well, I never thought of that. So he moved that feeder and he instantly, almost instantly, started getting bucks that he had never gotten bucks photos of before. And just by moving, and it was only 100 yards. Hmm. But that little bit of difference made a difference in the deer's pattern and them finding it and their, their, their travel. And, you know, so many people just don't yeah. put the, the, the thought into it. I mean, we talked to a lot of different people, and I think that's the first time that strategy has ever, ever been brought up about – putting food or i mean not well, putting food one putting, of those reasons because nobody wants to talk about it like well possibly they, yeah. they're like oh you're a baiter or yeah, whatever the case possibly. may be yeah. um every and and uh, you know i don't want to call people but even, out but even when uh we use bait on a couple private pieces whether we're feeding apples or, or corn or whatever right like i dump it wherever i can get to <laughs> the easiest right like on it's, like honestly and that's just human nature but yeah. it's not always necessarily it's not always right yeah right no that's yeah but you know it um it it has great advantage and um you know if, if you use it as a tool it it definitely is sure. is huge yep yeah well i think we covered a lot of good things and i feel like i've just been babbling on so i don't no <laughs> no it was good we have uh i know we have more <laughs> in store for this evening so i think we'll probably wrap it up here i really appreciate you 
stopping by after the show and recording this. I really enjoyed yeah, no the problem. story. That's really cool. I'd, I always love talking deer hunting. So I can tell. <laughs> no, it's, I really appreciate it. Um, if you want to, if you want to plug anything, feel free to do that. Or if you want to encourage people to go watch the Whitetail Cribs episode, they should. After after listening to this and they haven't seen it yet, they really should. Yeah. Um, you know, Whitetail Cribs. Uh, I I don't know what's the best way to find it on Ohio or um, I'm not sure what the. Well, let me see what those titled. One second here. And I'm on also on, I got a few hunts that I've done over the years on YouTube. Yep. Um, you could go there. I think my channel's just like D Riffle. Mm-hmm. Um, Instagram, Damien Hunts. Um, Facebook, I'd rather, I try to keep that somewhat family and friends sure. and not a random bunch people of on the random internet. Random people, <laughs> strangers. Yeah. So, so yeah, if you type in uh, White Tail Cribs, Ohio, home full of giant white tails elk moose and bears they'll find it perfect so. i've had a lot to that since then i think uh i've added uh a big mule deer a bear two elk or no an elk and two white tails 160 and 177 so in two years i've had a pretty good run <laughs> light work <laughs> Jeez. that's great well we appreciate it and uh i'll do it again next time across pass absolutely